Are you excited to be in church? Say yes. yes. Are you awake? Say yes. yes. Are you still recovering from Iowa losing yesterday? Yes. Me too. How do you beat Penn State and then do that? That's terrible. That's why we're in church, to find healing and hope again. If you believe that, say yes. I love being in Iowa because I'm a, I'm a wrestler, and it's my favorite sport. And so it's like the one state in the union that I can get picked up by someone who didn't wrestle or doesn't wrestle currently, and you can still have a casual conversation about someone from the Iowa Hawkeye team. And so uh, and the, the Cyclones are pretty good too, by the way. You have a kid named David Carr who's unbelievable, but we're not here to talk about wrestling. Can we pray? Let's we'll get spiritual. Heavenly Father, I just come before you, God, and I pray that um, in this service that you would make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. I only want to say what you're saying. I only want to do what you're doing. God, I just, you can do so much in so little time, so we give you uh, this time that we have here together and for the rest of this week and ask you to do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, New Hope said? Amen, amen. Um, so uh, as Pastor Hill said, I am currently residing in Texas. I originally grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and then went to school and pastored for a little while in Dallas, and then I pastored in New York, and then pastored in South Florida, and now we're back in Dallas. Say that's a lot. You're like, how old are you? <laughs> old enough to have a mustache, praise God. Um, and uh, in any case, I, I, um, I'm the CEO of Kingdom Global. We're a missions organization that's in 37 nations. I also pastor a local church called Trinity and um, get to do some cool stuff like this. One of my favorite titles is uh, Husband and Father. So I want to introduce you to my family. My wife's actually preaching back at church for me this morning. Um, everyone say, forgive Gabriel for wearing a Godfather shirt. It was given to me, and we are in a judgment-free zone because of the grace of God. Amen? <laughs> but it was my favorite picture because we all went hiking in Yosemite National Park, and so there to the right, uh, I guess, yeah, you're right. I'm facing the same way. You're right. That's actually my oldest. He looks like he's shorter than the other little guy because he's on a slope, but that's my little Gabriel. He is uh, incredibly type A, super genius. The other day, he told me, Dad, did you know that he's in kindergarten. So, did you know that Abraham Lincoln was responsible for helping free the slaves? And I'm like, well, that's a great descriptive there, responsible, five years old. And then he proceeds to say this. And he signed the document. I mean, he's literally using these words. The document called the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> he says every syllable, enunciates it perfectly. And I'm like, wow. And he's the kid that when he was 18 months old would get all his Hot Wheels, color coordinate them, and put them front facing back and park them before he went to sleep. To this day, he matches his underwear and his socks the night before he goes to sleep. I'm like, I got, I'm in trouble, I know. Some of you are like, how behaved and disciplined? I'm like, no, it's really challenging. And, uh, and it's okay, the other guy there to the left is Judah. He is not like that. <laughs> he is the kid that keeps you humble. You're like, man, I am raising this one right in the ways of the Lord. And this one's like, I want to fight. I mean, he's just like rocking out all the time. He has the deepest voice. He's so cute, deep, raspy voice. And he, um, I come home from, from work, and he'll be like, hi, daddy. And, uh, and then I have my baby girl, Eliza Ruth. She just turned two um, this July. I tell her, who's daddy's baby girl? And she says, and she literally does this. She goes, me. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, 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 time out. Who taught you how to bury your chin and lift your shoulder like that? Me. Nobody taught her that. She just does it. I'm like, what in the world? This is, I don't know, I'm in trouble. So... And then there is my, my Dominique. She, we've been married two weeks ago, 12 years. And um, she's my best friend, God's greatest gift to me. And um, so thankful she's preaching this morning. Um, so God, I just pray you fill her lips and give her unction this morning. God, I pray that you would move in Dallas, Texas through the words uh, that Dominique has prepared. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, 
Let's open up our scriptures today to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. If you're taking notes today, the title of today's sermon is called Through the Wild. If you're taking notes, you're 10 times more likely to go to heaven, but the choice is yours. But the choice is yours. You're 10 times more likely to go to heaven. That is in the Gabriel translation, but the choice is yours. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. I'm reading out of the NLT translation because that's the New Latino translation. I memorized my scriptures when I first started in New King James, and I study in the ESV, and I'm not confused. I'm just integrated. Amen. Are you ready? Say yes. Verse 16, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. Isaiah is talking about, obviously, the exodus from Egypt and the, the, the toppling down of the most powerful army at that time in Pharaoh's chariots, and just like that, bringing them to their knees. And then Isaiah pivots in this text to, taste, to say something really rather interesting and just go, whoop, and he says these, these, this interesting statement, but forget all that, but let that go. Wait, wait, time out. These are miracles. These are your wonders. This is your provision, but forget all that. So I almost say like you got to say it with like an urban euphemism, like forget all that. Like with some swagger, like what? Like moving on. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I make a pathway through the wilderness or through the wild. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the fields will thank me, the jackals and owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. I have made Israel for myself and they will someday honor me before the whole world. As we're waiting for God to do something new. This is usually a New Year's Eve text, and I sometimes just make the joke that, like, I, I've never been a big New Year's Eve, and I get a New Year's word, and if you do, that's great. You're probably more spiritual than me, and you can lay hands on me after, but you know how it usually goes, right? In 2008, we're going to be great. In 2009, it's going to be all mine. 2010, we're going to do it again. And in 2011, it's going to be like Levin. You know, we always usually have those words in 2019. We're going to be green. I don't know. You know, whatever it is. 2020, it was supposed to be vision and clarity, and then everything got foggy. Hello. And we sometimes feel tired trying to figure out what is next, God? What's new? Have you ever just been tired of hoping that this season would end? And we're in a peculiar moment in, the, in, in really human history. I would argue that it's never been like this before in that we're all having such a collective corporate experience. The, the ramifications of our last election, COVID, the pandemic, 2021, mandates, non-mandates, uh, what, what that does to our workplace or, or, or not workplace, to our schools and so on and so forth has forced us all into a collective experience. We're all in the the same storm we're in different boats and so it may affect us in differing ways however we're in the same storm it's usually not like that in a room like this you would have some going through the trial of their life and others experiencing the exuberance of a grandchild being birthed the exuberance of a first home first home purchase or getting married and and so you have all these myriad of experiences but in a room like this we're all going through the same storm with different experiences is, and God is saying, through the wild, through this moment, I'm doing a new thing. Do you believe that? Say yes. The children of Israel, where they receive this prophetic unction, is extremely important. 
Because most of us, must, some of us would say, maybe we are where we are as a country, as a community, as a family, as a church, as a result of consequence. Maybe a consequence because of obedience or disobedience, but that's why we're here. And we feel far from our promise, far from what we think this is supposed to look like when God is moving and putting his hand on the human drama. This, it just feels like we're really far. Well, the children of Israel, when they receive this prophecy, are in exile. They're prisoners of war, they're under duress, there's constant threat all around them, and they feel extremely far from the promise. God, I thought we're the chosen people supposed to have a land, and that you were going to lead us through. And you have all these great miracles, and you're saying, forget all of that, while I'm in exile, and I feel extremely far from promise. And they felt as if it was a result of consequence, and it was. And yet God says, behold, I do a new thing through the wild. Do you believe this? Say yes. Now, it's important to take note of where this takes place in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah will function a, a, a lot of times in, in the whole of the Bible as a motif or an outline of what God is doing in the biblical record from Genesis to Revelation. When our Bible was canonized, it was canonized into 66 books. Canonized, just big fancy word to say, when it was established into the Bible that you and I now hold, it was, it was put together as 66 books. Isaiah is put together as 66 books chapters. If you look at Genesis and Exodus, you will find that they are both outlined in Isaiah chapter 1 and in Isaiah chapter 2. If you look at the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, like the Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible, you will see what is primarily being dealt with is sin, judgment, and man's repentance. If you look at the latter 27 chapters, much like the New Testament, from Matthew to Revelation, you will find, from the 40th chapter to the 66th, you will find that it was primarily dealing with restoration, redemption and the recreation of man. You will find that if you look at the 66th chapter of, of Isaiah and then look at the 66th book, Revelation, you will see that a new Jerusalem, a new Zion is being established. Are you tracking with me? Say yes. So when you see this take place in the text, we have to take note that this is a motif, a prototype, or an outline, or an indicator on how God works. God changes what he does all the time, but he gives us key indicators so that we know how he principally moves. Do you believe that? Say amen. We find ourselves in Isaiah 43. Right after that shift happens in the book in Isaiah 40, we're coming from sin, repentance, and judgment, and we're coming right into those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up like eagles in sore. And then we find ourselves in verse 43. And if we're going to make it through the wild and see the new that God is going to do, if you would allow me to just extrapolate two key thoughts from this text, and I'll be out of your way, and then you got to come back tonight, and you got to come back Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, because I believe God wants to say a whole great deal more. But if we're just going to see the new thing, and we're going to make it through the wild, do you believe that this moment in human history is wild? Raise your hand. We're gonna to go to class. Okay, we're, I'm in the room. This is wild. If we're going to do that, we have to forget the former things. And we have to be able to see the new thing. If we're gonna make it through the wild, we're gonna to have to forget the former things and we're gonna to have to be able to see the new thing. Number one, that we would forget the former things. And he's not talking about our past failures in this text. He's not talking about our mistakes. He's not talking about mishaps. He's talking about miracles. He's talking about the glory. He's talking about the provision and power of God. But forget all that. How many of you love to watch movies? There's only four of us that aren't spiritual. I love you too. My wife is like one of the most conservative, holy Christians I know. She doesn't watch TV. Pray for her. <laughs> She's like a throwback to a 1930 Pentecostal. That was funny, y'all. That was funny. So some of you are like, what was a 1930 Pentecostal like? <laughs> Extremely conservative. And so she, but I love movies. And my wife, she legitimately doesn't watch TV. It's, it's a crying shame because if it was up to me, I would be able to, I would find a really good movie and binge watch the whole thing like Star Wars, 
all the way through or Lord of the Rings all the way through. Like I love watching movies. And my, I had an uncle when we were younger that would t pick me and my brother up every other Friday and, he, and we would call it movie night. We'd be able to go to this movie conglomerative and we'd be able to rent a movie and a video game. And we loved going to this place. My uncle was so cool. He would get butter and put it in a pan and put the fire on, melt the butter and then get the melted butter, pour it into a spray bottle and spray the popcorn, say glory. I mean, that is, a, some of you got an idea. You're like, I'm watching football this afternoon. I'm melting the butter and I'm spraying it on the popcorn. And so he, he would, and we, I love this place. He would take us to this movie conglomerative where we would go in and we'd rent these movies and we would get these video games and we would come out and then you had to return it by the next week and then you can, you know, repeat. And we had these little membership cards and sometimes you'd walk in, there was only one movie left and you'd walk in, you'd go to grab the movie, you're like, oh, I don't have my membership card. And you'd have to run back out to the car, grab your membership card and then the movie was gone. It was terrible. This place had monopolized movie rentals. It had taken over the whole industry and owned it. It was a place that you don't see very often anymore. In fact, they're not in existence. It was a place called Blockbuster. It was a place called Blockbuster. How many of you ever used to go to Blockbuster and rent movies there? And we had the little, you know, how many we got? We got taken to the cleaners on late fees. It was terrible. Yes, yeah, some were like, oh, I bought that movie five times before I returned it. That was terrible. And you know what happened is they were approached on moving to subscription-based media. And when they got asked to move to subscription-based media, the current CEO at the time said, why would I ever do that when 12% of my revenues comes from late fees? Why would I ever, ever do that? Why, why would I move to a subscription-based media? And Blockbuster was <coughs> busy celebrating past victories, busy celebrating having taken over an industry. They were busy, sorry, excuse me, I never happens to me. They were busy celebrating all this, hold on. Hallelujah. Yes, they were busy celebrating past victories. All of these things, sitting there, high-fiving each other in a boardroom, and they failed to realize where the industry was going, that it was going to a subscription-based model, and it was never to return, and it was never to come back. It wasn't to be realized ever again. It, the, chair, the train had left the station, and they missed it, celebrating past victories. Did you know that Alibaba is the largest retail in the world, and they own no inventory? Did you know that Netflix is the largest uh, uh, television provider and they lay no cables? Instagram is the largest photo company in the world and they do not make cameras. Facebook is the largest news out, media outlet in the world and they produce no news. <laughs> Somebody said fake news. That's another person providing fake news on their platform, but they do not produce news in and of themselves. Did you know that Uber is the largest taxi provider in the world and they do not own vehicles? Did you know that Airbnb is the largest accommodation service in the world and they own no real estate? Listen, church, if we're going to move into through the wild, we have got to forget former things. And I'm concerned that we have these arbitrary ideas of what we think the move of God in our family, in our community, and in our city, and in our country is supposed to look like. Because we've seen past miracles, we try to project it on the future, and we're missing what God is doing in this season, in this moment, and in this time. And what I'm saying is not that the past was unimportant, and not that we don't honor it and celebrate it. Hear me, the Bible is clear. We have feasts, and we have, we have memory. memory Memory, memories built. In fact, God tells Joshua, build an altar here. As we cross over in the Jordan, build monuments. Tell your children in your coming and in your going about these commandments that they will know who I am in Deuteronomy 6 and 11, he tells Moses. There is something to remember, and we should celebrate Christmas and talk about the incarnation and the birth of Jesus Christ. We should celebrate Easter. We look back, but you have to know that we honor and we celebrate the past, but the kingdom of God is married to the future because God is always doing a new thing. Do you believe that? Say yes. 
Come on, 930, are you awake? Say yes. We're going to make it through the wild, and God is always doing a new thing. Sometimes the most limiting thing to what God is doing is knowledge of the past because we limit God, and we don't know how to enter into imagination. But God says this, I can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ever ask, think, or imagine. That's a participatory scripture. That means you and I have got to begin to imagine and think and ponder and meditate on what God can do and then watch him do exceedingly abundantly above all of that do you believe that say yes when we camp out in prior movements we create museums instead of a movement we want it to look like it did when we encountered God maybe for you it was at church camp but maybe for your kid it's in the living room Maybe for most of us, some of you are watching online, you had to be in a service and now people are encountering Jesus through their mobile phone with crusts in their eyes still, drinking a cup of coffee with their pajama pants on. And if we're stuck to a religious model, we think it could only happen in church. Forget the former things. I know that the 1950s tent revivals were awesome, but nobody wants to sit in a tent now. It's not air conditioned, hello, nor heated, amen. I fell in love with Jesus, listening to Darling Check Shout to the Lord in 2000. You wanna know what no youth group wants to sing right now? Shout to the Lord, Darling Check from 2000. And I have to forego my preferences so that a new generation can encounter him afresh. Is it you believe that? Say yes. God is always doing a new thing. Forget the former things because God is wanting to do a new thing. In Jeremiah 16, 14, and in Jeremiah 23, 7, this interesting scripture, it says this, that no longer will you say, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. But I'm, also, I'm now the God who's brought you from the northern countries. In other words, you're not going to relate to me by just my strong arm in the Exodus. You will see me as the God who continues to provide, who's brought you back from exile, who's now crippled the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Romans and any other person who's tried to take them from this land and be a chosen people because God is saying, I've never established you to be and see me as the God of the good old days, but I'm the God of today, I'm the God of yesterday, and I'm the God of tomorrow. Forget the former things because we try to project on the, uh, on the new what God did in the past and we end up making terrible reruns or a horrible sequel when God is into original motion pictures today he wants to do a new thing do you believe that say yes forget the former things Re revelations 21 verse 5 i am making all things new present tense verb i am making all things new god is doing something today we have to catch this because formerly it probably looked like we had more of a political dominance or a cultural dominance or more of a nuclear family. That must be how God is going to move. And could it be, if that's how we think God's supposed to move, we're gonna have to repent to the Chinese and Iranian church because they're the fastest growing churches in the world and they are the minority. They are salt in a country that does not accept them, salt. That illustration was never one of dominance, but it was one that was subversive and one that was a minority. If you oversalt something, you ruin it. So I'm here to tell you, you could take away all our cultural influence. You could take away all the holiness that we hold dear that is still biblical. I don't care what any, listen, hear from the young person. Holiness is never going on sale. It's always gonna be expensive. It's always gonna cost us everything. And it's always what God calls us to say amen. But I'm telling you right now, but if we're trying to portray that we need cultural influence, we need this, we need this dominance, we need this in office, we need whatever the thing is, we need big church services, we need it. And I'm trying to tell you right here, that right now, forget what it looked like in the past. God's doing something now. How he is going to do it. 
is yet to be defined, but who is doing it is unchanging, unwavering. His name is Jesus. He's not insecure. He's not broken. He's not in a grave. He's risen. The kingdom of God is still being established. It's still on the move. We have to forget the former things and know that he's doing it in a fresh, new way. Do you believe that? Say yes. Forget the former things. The second thing is to see the new thing. When I was just coming of age into adulthood, I, I, my mom was recovering from an addiction. My stepdad went back to prison. It was a very tough time. And so I was just entering into my freshman year of college. And I didn't want my mom to have to go back to selling drugs and, doing her, and, and being a part of her addiction. So I wanted her to be able to finish school. And so I, I went to work during the day as a commercial electrician. I went to school at night and youth pastored bivocationally. It wasn't even bivocationally, it was volunteer vocation. Say amen. And what I didn't realize about being a commercial electrician, the first day I got on the job site, I thought I'd be wiring up receptacles or putting together a fan or a light. And I was a commercial electrician, much like a building like this. And what I didn't realize is that when you get on a job site this big, for three to four months, you're just in the dirt. It's terrible. In the hot southwest sun. And so I was an apprentice and I had journeymen. So you know what they did? They put a shovel in my hand. And what I didn't realize is I'd be digging trenches for three to four months, pulling in all these feeder wires, coordinating with plumbers and iron workers to put in the rebar before we poured the concrete and I was like I thought I was going to be in an air conditioned building wiring up a fan and instead I'm over here earning my PhD my pick and hold degree I'm like what in the world it's when I effectively joined the mad organization Mexicans against ditch digging amen and I was like I, I do not this is terrible and I would dig all day and I would go to school at night and then I was youth pastoring on the uh, not on the side but you know that was but youth pastoring as well and, and still dating my girlfriend and trying to provide for my whole family and make sure that my mom still got through college but what I realized is something is that when you're on a job site you don't realize all that's happening before the walls are ever erected before you can actually see with your eyes some of you may have been looking at this addition and there may have been moments where you're like are they even working are they union <laughs> I don't see anything happening because you didn't see walls you didn't see the earth being moved underneath. You didn't probably see the feeders being being dug. You didn't see the plumbing going in. You didn't see the rebar being laid. And if you've ever seen highway traffic, you are livid. You are out of your mind. You can't stand the traffic that is incurred by all the cones every day. And then one morning you wake up and you're like, I can see clearly now the cones are gone. And all of a sudden, the highway is open. You ever been there? Yeah, and you're like, yes, Lord, thank you. They finally got to work. And what we don't realize because we're at a distance and we're not intimately involved in the thing that's being built is that we can think that work is not being accomplished. But the fact is that that foundation's being laid and in a few short moments, you're gonna see walls go up all over the place. It's gonna start to be framed and the guts are gonna come inside. And here's the reality about the kingdom of God. It's not always seen with our eyes or observance but it is a kingdom that is in motion that is always being established God is not sitting in heaven cowering away because boom in a moment you'll see what has always been and that God is always working can you see the new thing we have to be a people that are alert because we subscribe to a God who is into the suddenlies suddenly there was a sound like that of a rushing wind in Acts chapter 2 in the church Church was birthed and established in Acts chapter 2 suddenly did you know that most historians and theologians believe that it took 20 minutes for Joseph to go from the prison to the palace it was a 20 minute walk in 20 minutes grandma your young your, your grandchildren can be saved in 20 minutes a family can be revived in 20 minutes God can encounter a government official that you didn't vote for that God established there that's what Romans 13 and 2nd Timothy says all authority has been established there by God whether you like it or I like it or anyone else likes it we believe that in 20 minutes suddenly God can do whatever he wants because that is the kingdom of God it is unshakable 
It, the, king, the church is not dead. We're not dying. We're not cowering away. The church of the living God will transcend. A donkey will transcend an elephant because it's not the most popular way. It's not the democratic way. It's not the Republican way. He is the way. Amen? The kingdom of God is always, always working. It is always, always working. We are not on the job site of what's happening in the spiritual realm because God, and we have to keep our eyes open to see the thing that God is doing. He says, I make a way in the wilderness and he doesn't tell us the way. He tells him creating springs in the desert and he doesn't tell us how. Springs don't exist in deserts. But that's the supernatural provision of God. Does that make sense? Say yes. Does that make sense? Say yes. Suddenly, suddenly, he can raise up a prostitute in Jericho to allow the spies to see a way in. If I was God, I'm not raising up a prostitute in a military garrison. I'm, I'm getting a four-star general to be a traitor and give me all the secrets. But when God does something new, he always uses the unlikely. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26. How many of you were noble? How many of you were good report? How many of you, in other words, Gabriel translation, had it all together? Not many. For God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So could it be when God is doing something new, it's going to confound us? We're critical of the Pharisees for missing Jesus. But if you read the Old Testament prophecies, it's very much understandable to believe that they thought he was coming in dominance to free them from Roman oppression. That is so reasonable when you read the New Testament, not in light of knowing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And could it be that we think that the next move of God is supposed to look in a certain way? And we're missing what he's doing right now. And we're missing what he's doing in my life right now. God is never going to deliver you from something that makes you more like him. Some of you need to hear that. Because God is more concerned with who you're becoming than what you're doing. Amen? It's really quiet in this Presbyterian church. I love Presbyterians, by the way. Hello. One of my favorite theologians is Presbyterian. God, I got to be so careful. Online, I love you. Please don't pick up offenses that I'm not putting down. Sorry, Pastor. I'm trying to recover. He uses Gideon, a coward, to be a mighty warrior. Over and over, God is changing the modus operandi on how he does something. But who he is never changes. Abraham, go to a land that you don't know. That don't make no sense. That doesn't make any sense. And from your small family, I'm going to create a nation. Right. I'm going to take your family into 400 years of slavery, but will, from my perspective, be protective custody. Because if you stay out here as a small band, you're going to get picked off by the, by the, by the surrounding nations in ancient antiquity. They're going to smolder you down. So I'm going to put you under the wing of the most powerful nation in the world. It's going to look like slavery to you, but what it really is is protective custody because I'm going to grow you to 2 million people so that when I deliver you, you're going to take all their gold, you're going to take all their silver, and you're going to be strong enough to go conquer the nations in which I, to which I am sending you. Do you see the perspective of God? Is so be, no, no, it has never entered into the mind nor has no eye seen what God has prepared for those who love him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. That that is the hand of God that he's doing a new thing can we see the new thing and not project what we think it's supposed to look like if I could have the band come up I just believe that God is tagging people in this room and saying you're it one of the things that I do believe, and I have a conviction about this, and not to project what the new should look like, but what I do believe is that the third century, when Constantine instituted the uh, church, uh, the Christianity as the, as the national state religion for the Roman Empire, what the, one of the mistakes he did is he instituted a separation between clergy and laity. Big fancy terms to just say a separation between those in full-time ministry and those who work in the market. And he created a professionalism to this. 
And what essentially happened is we replicated temple worship when God was wanting to be 5G LTE. Let me explain. We're back on an elevated platform, just like into the tabernacle. We came behind a lectern, I mean the Ark of the Covenant, and we put on priestly garments, and we became professionals in the royal priesthood. But First Peter tells us that we're all a royal priesthood. And so I don't have a calling and you have a job. There's no such thing as full-time ministry or part-time ministry. There's only full-time kingdom. Say amen. Business owner, business owner, hear me. You are an apostolic father in your business place. See that as fertile ground for the kingdom of God. Teacher, janitor, electrician, lawyer, contractor. You are God's mouthpiece and representation in that place. Can you see the new? Don't wait for a pastor. If we're waiting for that, we're gonna miss it. We're gonna miss it. Amen? There's only full-time kingdom. There's only full-time kingdom. God, when he calls us through the wild, will always take us to a place where it's undefined, it's scary, it's sometimes ambiguous, and it takes a whole lot of faith because that requires dependence on him. That requires dependence on him. You know, in the first Exodus, it says that he, he pulled back the waters in the Red Sea and they walked through dry ground. In the second one, he's saying he's gonna create water on, in the dry ground instead of pulling back the water to reveal dry ground. To tell us this, I'm not gonna do it the same way. But the latter is to give you an indicated an indicator that I'm able to do, or the former is an indicator that I'm able to do the latter. The miracles that we see in the Bible, the miracles that you've encountered in your own personal life are indicators that God can do it again. How he does it may change, but who does it, does it, did it and does it, does not. Is that good news? Say yes. Through the wild, through the wild, this is a wild time. This is a wild time. I used to think I wasn't God's man because I wasn't generationally from a ministerial family. And I believe God works generationally like that. And sometimes he'll pass on callings like that. And my sons may wanna go into the ministry and I would love for that to be part of our legacy. And if it isn't, then they'll, they'll be in another profession, but they'll, they'll still love Jesus and build his kingdom. But that wasn't my story. I'm the first believer in my family. My father was in prison for 26 years of my life. He never saw me throw a football. He never saw me shoot a basketball, never saw me wrestle in a match, didn't see me run in track, missed everything. He didn't see me date, he didn't see me get married, he didn't see the birth of my three children. He didn't see me graduate high school, he didn't see me graduate college. He missed everything. And the first time I held him was May 17th, I'm sorry, 2017, May 24th, May 24th, 2017. I held him for the first time he got released from prison. I picked him up in downtown Manhattan. I was pastoring in New York and he got paroled to my house. And the first time I held him since I was eight years old was in that moment because I'd only seen him three times in that whole long prison sentence and it was through a glass window on a phone. It was the first time I hugged him and the previous time I hugged him for, for that was his hand was behind his back with cuffs and I was just hugging him as a little boy in a federal courtroom. My mom struggled with a crack cocaine addiction that morphed into meth. In my high school years, they sold a lot of meth and heroin out of my house and I was in the back room of my, of my, of my house falling in love with Jesus, say through the wild. Say through the wild. 
And I would grab this book and I just started to devour it, sitting in that back room, sharing it with my brother. And I didn't know what Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 says. I didn't know that I was supposed to go into the closet, shut the door, pray in private, and your father who sees in private will reward you openly. I didn't know that it said that. I just knew that that was the only place of solace I had in my entire home. I would get three by five cards and I would write down scriptures and I would memorize them like flashcards, put them in my pocket. And then I would go into the shower because I wanted to continue to memorize scripture and I would put it in a Ziploc baggie and stick it to the back of the of the shower so I can continue to memorize scripture while I was washing my hair it gave a whole new definition to bathing in the word and my mom is addicted to meth in the next room and they're selling meth and heroin out of my house I got raised around a gang that History Channel would come into a documentary on on a show called Gangland, called the bloodiest gang in the Southwest. And I'm sitting in that environment, I'm watching people get stabbed, and I'm falling in love with Jesus. And here's the thing, I was reading that Bible, I didn't understand it correctly. I didn't know proper hermeneutics and exegesis and eisegesis, and, but I was falling in love, say, through the wild. Long story short, I ended up meeting my wife. We are the perfect recipe for dysfun dysfunction but God. Her mom's a heroin addict her whole life, in and out of prison. Dominique was raised without a mother, raised by a single dad with four siblings. We come together and we're, we're, we're crazy about Jesus. And we start going after the things of God. We, we, we get married in 2009. And by 2010, revival is sweeping through our family. Say, through the wild. Say, through the wild. Moms, dads, 2014, my dad calls me from federal prison. Gabriel, I don't know about this Jesus thing, but this is, I wanna know him the way you do. Which started a journey that continues today of my dad accepting and seeing Jesus reveal himself to him. Say through the wild. I'm first to ever buy a home in my family, first to go to college, first to go to graduate school, a whole lot of firsts. Forget the former things, even the miracles in my life. I wanna see him do new ones with my kids. I wanna see him raise up new Gabriels from the inner city parts of America. I wanna see him do new things, do you? Do you, can we get out of the way and allow God to do a new thing? Through the wild, I forget the former things, I wanna see a new thing. Do you wanna see that? Will you stand to your feet? I just want us to worship, let's, let's just sing Fresh Wind.